All right, so the next thing that we want to think about are just, or not really think about, but introduce you to are some of the common functions in MATLAB. Common MATLAB functions. Now, the idea behind this is like, okay, you want to say, well, I'm going to be bilingual in Spanish, but I'm not actually going to memorize any of the vocabulary. If I need to know for like Dora, I'll be like, I don't know, I'll go look it up. <laughs> so clearly then you're not bilingual. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the functions that you need to know to kind of be bilingual in MATLAB. Okay. So really um, what I'd like you to do, and it's probably a difference between what you're going to do and what I'd like you to do, but um, I'd love for you to go through here and actually look at all of these functions and go investigate. So for example, on the absolute, on the ABS, ABS, you can probably guess what that's going to do, but um, your first step is probably, depending on the kind of person you are, your first step could probably be to type help ABS. And if I do that, I'll get, all right, absolute value. Well, not, not, not desperately, not desperately confusing. Um, but if I want to know what the absolute value is, then what you should actually start doing is, is playing around. So I'm going to copy these over here for a little bit. Um, you actually want to practice with these. So um, take different types of, of inputs and see what you get. So, you know, you're probably pretty sure that, um, so like, let's just make up some here. So, um, I don't know, like negative five. I don't know why I put it in brackets. Well, I know why, because let's say I've got um, negative three and negative 2.5 and negative 1.7 and zero and one, I'll just do it kind of like mirrored on the other side. And, and that should give us some good information. So I say, okay, well, what's the absolute value of A? And I'll run it and I'll get, okay, well, that's kind of what I expected. Um, so that said, um, you kind of put in some, well, I kind of put in some numbers that I'm not really surprised, but there's other kind of numbers too. There's like complex numbers. So what if I gave you something like x6 plus 3i and I asked you for the absolute value of that? Would you know what that is? You'd be like, wait, what is that? <laughs> that makes no sense. So um, what we'd actually need to do is, is go in and see how, see what that is. So let me change the numbers and see if they spark your imagination. So I'll go 3 plus 4i, and the absolute value of 3 plus 4i is 5. Um, the absolute value of 8 and 15 is 17. The absolute value of 7 plus 24i is 25. Does that, does that ring a bell? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so, so what was the first one I did? I did 3 plus 4i. So if I wanted to actually look at that, and you might not remember this, but the absolute value is basically how far are we away from the origin. So whether or not you remember, um, you can actually graph complex numbers on the real and the imaginary plane. Thank you. Um, so if I wanted to graph 3 plus 4i, that would be 3 over this way. Oh, aren't you a doll? 3 over this way and 4 up this way. So 3 plus 4i. So this is actually 3 plus 4i. All right, let's put a stop to that. Um, and when you're getting the absolute value, uh, what you're actually getting are, so if this is 3 and this is 4, maybe you remember your Pythagorean triples, but what you're getting is this 5 here. So whenever I'm taking the absolute value of a complex number, really what that is, is that's giving me the, um, the distance I, weigh, I am away from the origin. So if I was going with, um, I don't know, I forgot, I wasn't counting when I was doing that, I was just playing 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So if I had negative 6, so that'd be negative 6 minus 5i, negative 6 minus 5i, then what I'm really looking for are the, um, so it's negative 6 this way, or 6 this way, and 5 this way. So really what I'm looking for is the length of this guy, which is the square root of the sum of the squares, 6 squared plus um, 5 squared. So I expect to get a number like 36 plus 25, and I don't know what that is. Um, some kind of number, 61, maybe? I don't know what the square root of 61 is, but luckily I have MATLAB. You can do this for me. All right, 7.81. So let's see. If I put in um, minus 6, minus 5i, 
Yay, that's what I get. I get the absolute value of B is negative um, 7.81. So um, what I'd really think would be awesome is if you took some time and you actually examined all these functions for yourself, um, get an idea of what they actually do, play around with them, put in numbers that just seem really, really weird um, just to see what they do. Um, put in numbers that don't just put in regular vectors, put in, um, you know, put in, uh, what do we call those things? Matrices. So, you know, I'm going to even use some of the same numbers here. But if I put in a matrix, do I, do I get, you know, what I would expect to get? The answer is going to be yes, but, but that's okay. We still want to play around with it. So I'm going to make them line up and make them pretty because, you know, it's important to have pretty code. All right. That should really line up like that. <laughs> Alright, so now if I'm looking for the absolute value of C, I'm just going to get the absolute value of each individual number, which really shouldn't be that shocking. Okay, now I'm going to put these back up here. If you have any ability to do so, please pause the video, go play around with these, discover this for yourself. It's really, really, really important to get used to looking up the documentation, interpreting the documentation. And since you're pretty sure that SQRT is square root, since we've kind of already talked about it, and you're pretty sure what nth root is going to be, um, Go play with it anyway and see if um, and see if you can get something to make sense. Okay? So, so I'm gonna pretend you've done that. I'm actually gonna keep a lot of these values because I kind of like my little um, matrix thing up here. So I've got absolute value. Let's do the square root of A. And not surprisingly, when I take the square root of a negative number, it gives me imaginary values. So square root of zero is zero. But isn't that interesting how it comes as zero plus zero i? It's still casting everything in terms of a complex number, even though the um, imaginary element is in fact zero. Um, I forgot what the square root of a, yeah, I don't remember what that is. Because it's not what you would think it is. I have to go look that up. Um, square root of a, of a complex number square root of, a, of a that number. And those are just the same numbers that I had before, so that's not a shock. I wonder what that is. To be perfectly obvious, or not obvious, to be perfectly honest, I think it has something to do with complex analysis, which it's been a really, really long time, so I'm going to leave it at that. Now the nth root is, um, well, not really that big of a deal either. But the nth root, if you're trying to remember what that is, because if you haven't done algebra in a while, this is going to be a little weird. But it's important to be able to do math if you're going to program, trust me. So um, if we were going to look at the, um, so like if we take the square root of, uh, well, I didn't even need to write that. But if I was going to take the square root of a 9, I would just be like, oh, okay, well, that's 3. I don't know why I'm writing off the kids, but anyway. So you'd be like, okay, well, that's cool. And if I wanted to find the um, nth root of, say, 8, so the third root of 8, that would be 2, because 2 cubed is 8. So the third root of 8 is 2. Does that kind of make sense? Now, like you can't really find, well, you can. You can find the square root of negative 9. That's going to give you 3i. Um, if I took the cube root of a negative 8, I'd actually get negative 2. And you'd be like, well, how comes not an i? Um, you might remember that's because 2, negative 2 cubed is actually negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, which would be 4 times negative 2, which would be negative 8. So the nth root is just giving me well, exactly what it seems like it's going to give me. So I'm going to need to change some of my, um, I'm not going to use the same values that I was using before because it's a little weird, but if I want to say the nth root of 8, um, give me the third root, and that's going to give me 2. If I ask for the third root of negative 8, it's going to give me negative 2. So none of that is particularly shocking. Um, I'm going to try something fun, like what is the um, negative third root of negative 8? And you're like, that doesn't exist. Oh, sure it does. It's negative 1 half. Like, how is that even possible? That's insane. Um, we just have to remember that negative 8 um, to the or the nth root of negative 3. Remember that if you have a, um, so, well, let's put it this way. You might remember that if I'm going to write just the cube root of negative 8, I'm not writing all good The cube root of negative 8 is negative 8 to the 1 third, right? You're like, of course, doesn't everybody know that? Well, you need to know that. If you want to be a programmer, you've got to do math. All right, so if I'm doing negative 8 with the negative third root, then that's negative 8 to the negative one-third. 
And if you remember anything about negative exponents, that means that it's really 1 over negative 8 to the positive 1 third, which is going to give me 1 over negative 2, which is clearly 1 half. All right, so you can get weird little numbers like that. It's perfectly fine, and I'm sure you can do these for complex, but um, I wouldn't expect anyone to really know that off the top of their head, but I would, you know, theoretically like to think that someone would be able to do something like this off the top of their head. So that's definitely something you want to have um, at your fingertips. All right, so let's do sine of x. Now this is spelled S-I-G-N, not S-I-N-E. So um, the sine is quite literally the sine of x. So if I ask for the sine of a, um, I'm going to scroll up. So remember, I would expect to see, well, something. So this is not that surprising. So the sine of a, I have a negative value, a negative value, a negative value. Then I had a zero. Then I had a positive value, a positive value, and a positive value. So that just literally gives me the sign that was on there. If I ask for the sign, I can't spell, of a complex number. Um, I'm not exactly sure. It's just going to give me nonsense. Bleh, so I'm not going to worry about that. It's probably not nonsense. It's probably completely legit. I just don't want to know. Um, and then there's my negatives, and then there's my positives. So that, that makes sense with what I have above. Now, REM, that is actually a remainder theorem. For a remainder, we can't use the pre, pre-existing ones that we have up before. Um, but basically, the idea is if I have, um, let's say, um, 10 divided by 4, the answer is going to be 2. And you're like, that makes no sense. What is that? So um, a remainder is basically like a modulo. So if I say, um, what did I have? I had 12. 10, 10 divided by 4. So if I have 10 divided by 4, all right, you might think about that in terms of you know, like grade school. You'd say, okay, it's 10 divided by 4. Have a 2. That's 8. Okay, so that's remainder 2. Okay, so the 2 stands for remainder. So if I have, you know, 14 divided by 7, you're like, okay, so that's 14 divided by 7, 2 remainder 0. So I would expect if I said a remainder of 14 and 7, that should come back with a 0. And it does. All right, let's see if I can find anything else, any money, any more fun. Um, let's see, I have 17 divided by 3. All right, so that's going to be 17 divided by 3. That's 5. I keep getting 2s. I'm sorry, the answer isn't always 2, um, but that one is. Um, let's do... Um, 17 divided by 5. No, that's still going to be 2. How about 18 divided by 5? So I have 18 divided by 5. 3, 15, 3, remainder 3. Okay, so kind of get an idea, and we're not going to worry too much about what happens whenever you have negatives and, um, and stuff like that. We'll just deal with, with flat out normal remainders. All right, exp, actually, we've seen before. But nonetheless, let's go ahead and experiment with it. Turns out that XP is the exponential. So it's just like, I like how they've just like clearly, blah. So, um, so if I say EXP of 1, that should give me 2.7. And it does the 2.71. So that's just E like, like E. Second. Like E to the 2 pi i, which happens to be 1. Yay. Anyway. So, E, let's see, log. So, whenever you do log of x, you might go, well, okay, so what's the difference between log and log 10? You say, okay, so log. And you look and you say that this is actually the natural logarithm, which is a little weird because we're used to having ln be the natural logarithm on our calculator. But in MATLAB, log is the natural log. So, if I did the natural log of um, E squared, <laughs> I would expect to get two back. I don't have a really good example for that um, because we just don't have a lot of natural logs. I thought I told you to stop doing that, honey. All right, so um, so there we go. Now log 10 is log base 10. So if I say the log 10 of, um, I don't know, like 100, and you're like, well, what is that? And you're like, I don't remember because, you know, math. So if I say, what is log base 10 of 100? That basically means that um, it's always 10 to the x equals that. So 10 to the x equals 100. So x equals 2. So log base 10 um, of 100 would be would be 2. And 
that's what I get whenever I put that into into MATLAB. Let's see. Um, so difference between log and log 10, there is no ln function. Um, and kind of, do you remember how to find logs for regular stuff? Like what if I had, um, so what if I asked you for log base 8 of 14? Because you're like, I don't know. I mean, clearly that it's 8 to the blah blah is 14, but how do I figure that out? Um, you may or may not remember from college algebra or some similar kind of class, the, the base, change of base formula, which is basically that I can say log of 14 over log of 8. And it doesn't matter if I do it as in a log base E or a log base 10. I can't spell. Um, it's be a log 10. So, over log 10 of 8. So I can do that. So if I want to find log base 8 of 14, log base 8 of 14, I could say either, let's see, log of 8 over log of 14, or I could say log 10, 8 over log 10 of 14, or I could say log 2, which is another one. Um, I don't want to call them all x, y, and z, and I'm going to get the same answer every time x, y, and z. But it's important to note that there is no log base 8 of 14. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> it's going to say, what are you talking about? Did you mean that? And you're like, no, not really, but thanks. Got it? Great.